is an absolute joy to be with all of you. It is absolutely fantastic to see all of you here. Allow me to ask you, how many of you, if you clerked for this conference, would still be in bed at this time? <laughs> I see, I figured. And thanks for the warm welcome. I uh, want to say a word of gratitude to my brothers, Father Joseph, the pastor of this parish, who does a wonderful job, Father Ignacio, who helps with him as a parochial vicar. They are fantastic, and I'm really grateful for all they do here at, at St. Patrick's. I'm also uh, pleased and honored to welcome our guest in the Diocese of Dallas, Patrick Coffin, who is here, and, and Father Mitch Papua, who is here. Welcome to the Diocese of Dallas. We're glad to have you. from the Diocese of Fort Worth. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're here. So allow me to tell you, because my brothers here in the Diocese of Dallas have heard this, allow me to share with you, um, many of you know that I'm fairly new. I had just celebrated my second anniversary here in the Diocese of Dallas, and I might claim the fame is that I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus Council, the Great 799. Well, I went as the new bishop of the Diocese of Dallas to the state convention of the Knights of Columbus. And I actually thought that the Knights of Columbus were bishop friendly. All right, well, <laughs> what happened was being new and having moved, many of you know that prior to my being the Bishop of the Diocese of Dallas, for seven years I served as a missionary bishop in the Diocese of Juneau, Alaska. And so I served in Alaska for seven years. It was an adventure. It was wonderful. The smallest diocese in the country, population-wise, the smallest. And there's no roads in Juneau. As you well know, there's no roads. You can't drive in, you can't drive out. There are no roads in Juneau or anywhere in the diocese actually connecting any of the parishes. You can only get to Juneau by air or by water, okay? The diocese is actually the size of the state of Florida. There are over a thousand islands with no roads. And now I come to a diocese that has no islands and all roads. <laughs> it, it is amazing. Well, the diocese of, of uh, Juno was one of three dioceses. There's the Archdiocese of Anchorage, and there's also the Diocese of Fairbanks. The Diocese of Fairbanks is actually one and a half times the size of the state of Texas. That's how large that diocese is. Well, when I was assigned from the Diocese of Juneau um, to a diocese in Texas, my people in Juneau said, oh, Bishop, you're, you're being downsized. <laughs> and I said that to the Knights of Columbus at their national con or their state convention, and they started to grumble when I said that. And unfortunately, I didn't have enough sense to stop there. <laughs> I told them that in the Diocese of Juneau in Southeast Alaska, you have the Inside Passage, we get 1.3 million visitors a year on the cruise industry. And so there's t-shirt shops and souvenir shops everywhere. And there's, there's one t-shirt that has an outline of Alaska, and an outline of Texas. And the caption underneath of it is, Texas, how cute. <laughs> when I told that to the Knights of Columbus, they booed me. So I want to thank you for the warm welcome. <laughs> so it was when I was uh, assigned uh, there's this moment in which you uh, 
um, are still under the pontifical secret. No one knows who the next bishop is going to be. And there's the moment that the new bishop comes into town, almost like on a stealth fighter, you know, so no one knows who it is. But there's a group of people at the chancery office who know. And then there's, you wait until uh, the Holy Father makes the announcement in Rome at noon, Rome time. And then it becomes news, and then it's, everything's embargoed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it was um, on that day that I had met with, or rather the night before I came in and, and had a meeting with our chancery staff, and I said, what I'd like to do is, of course, 6 a.m., have, have mass with Bishop Kelly, and the auxiliary bishop. Uh, we're blessed with him. And then I, I'd like to have you know, a little breakfast, but then I have to start working the phones. I gotta tell people that, that I've moved, you know? And, and so, and actually I had a great opportunity to uh, meet with our staff. I said to him, I said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray with the chancery staff um, uh, first thing in the morning. And they said, oh, well, we, we usually don't do it that way. And I said, oh, it'll be okay. <laughs> so, I'm sure it'll be okay. Well, usually the new bishop is only seen first when we walk out, and it will be okay. We can pray, you know? So, indeed, and then um, it was later on that night um, that I said I wanted to have, after the press conference and everything, I wanted to have a Eucharistic adoration at one of the parishes of the diocese. They said, well, we usually don't do it that way. They said, it'll be fine. <laughs> pray, you know? And so I had Eucharistic adoration at, at St. Rita's. Well, throughout the day, it was like, slow news day in Dallas, so it was breaking news, new bishop in, in, in Dallas, and, and the next morning I had to get on to the 6 a.m. flight from DFW to Seattle and then on through Ketchikan, Sitka, and then Juneau um, to go back for a confirmation preparation class, you know, that I had. I'm standing there at 6 a.m., and it was on the, it was on the local paper local paper above the fold, the new bishop, and I'm standing there waiting for the six o'clock flight to Seattle, and this guy said to me, good morning, Father, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing well, how are you doing? Good, I'm doing well. So were you in town for the announcement of the new bishop? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, yes, I was. <laughs> then he looked at me and goes, wait a minute, you are the new bishop. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> it is an absolute honor and privilege to be the bishop of this diocese. I was telling Patrick that the one thing I'm proud of, I see, is how proud people are to be Catholic. And that's why I want to commend all of you, my brothers in faith, for your presence here today, for the way in which you live out your faith. And yes, it is an honor to stand in your presence. It is a privilege to be your shepherd. And it's a, truly a blessing for me to be with you this day. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to watch you grow in your relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and to know who you are. You know, as, as we're given that opportunity to identify ourselves, it's important that we identify ourselves as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and let's face it, it's not always easy. And it's not always easy to identify ourselves as Catholic, but indeed we need to know who we are. And we need to know who we are in the presence of our Lord and in the presence of our family members, the presence of the people that we work with, and people in our community. We, even the apostles had difficulty with that regard. And we see it played out in Scripture. So we look at what's happening in the church today and all the stuff that's hitting the fans. Again, these are difficult days in the church. And I think about what we do around this altar and how we celebrate the Eucharist. And in that moment, we commemorate the Last Supper when Jesus engaged in a new and everlasting covenant with us, with his body and his blood powerful, powerful moment. And then we see those apostles who sat around the table with him. And you see that they weren't quite sure what they were doing. They still had their own personal interests that they brought to that table. 
And sitting at that table as Jesus established the first Eucharist at the Last Supper, that new and everlasting covenant for us, you see one of them had betrayed him. And then another one was about to deny him. And then another one, I suspect, was sitting there doubting what he was saying and doing. And in Luke's Gospel, we see that at the Last Supper, a fight breaks out, an argument over who's going to be the greatest in the Kingdom of Heaven. <coughs> that was the Last Supper. That was the first Eucharist. It was a scandal. And we look today, and we see as though this church of ours just can't shake scandal. Because we look at what's happened in the church today, and some have betrayed us. Yes, some even in church leadership. And there's some in our church who continue to deny him. And then there's some, even present here, who continue to doubt God's ways, the church's teachings. And unfortunately, even in our church today, there are still some who argue over who's going to be the greatest. That's our church. And it's a scandal. Our church, it seems as though, was born in scandal. And therein lies <coughs> our need to bind ourselves close to our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know many of you question what's happening in the church. Many of you have family members who are starting to drift away because of what's happening in the church. Well, it's important that we remind those who have a tendency to drift away that you never separate yourself from Jesus because of Judas. You never separate yourself from Jesus because of Judas. And we bind ourselves ever closer to our Lord Jesus Christ during these moments and to his cross. And so, after that Last Supper, Jesus was taken into custody. He was arrested. And the apostles, what did they do? They fled. And they watched from a distance all that happened to him. That after he was arrested, he was bound to a pillar and they gave him 40 lashes. The apostles just simply blended into the crowd. They watched that. They watched as he was crowned with thorns and then he was given a cross to carry. <coughs> they all watched that. With the exception of one who had the ability to stand by the Blessed Mother's side, as we see in John's Gospel. And then while all of this is happening, they approach Peter and they said, aren't you one of his disciples? I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Brothers, it's important that we know who we are. We are disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not always easy identifying our love for Him. And it's not always easy in this world to proclaim the Gospel message. They watched Him as He fell. They watched, mixed in with the crowd as they laid Him on that cross and pounded those nails into his hands and into his feet as they pierced his side with the lance. They saw it all. They placed him in a tomb. And those apostles, those brothers, they just clung to one another out of fear. They were afraid. And 
I'm grateful for Bill and the wonderful introduction he gave me and, and his reference. What I said to those young people, keep your gaze on him. Keep your gaze on the Lord is a message that we heard at the transfiguration. Because at that transfiguration, Jesus is transfigured in their sight. And we gotta love Peter. Peter's so much like us. He's impulsive. He's human. And Peter's going on saying, oh, I'm gonna build three booths. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And you can just, and the scripture says, while he's still talking, all right? See, you can only imagine, I'm gonna use two by fours, and then I'm gonna use, you can only imagine what he's saying. The scripture says, while he's still talking, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And Peter, James, and John, they hit the deck. They hit the ground. They covered their heads. They were once again afraid. And Jesus came over and touched them. Touched them. And they looked up and they saw only Jesus. That is what I refer to when I tell people that as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we keep our gaze on him. Let us see only Jesus. And let's face it, in our world, in our lives, in our struggles, our humanness, our sinfulness, our limitedness, we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, please touch me. Touch me like you touched the early apostles. So that I won't fear my addictions, my troubles, my anger. So I won't fear in stepping up and proclaiming my love for you. So I won't be afraid to proclaim a gospel of life in this culture of death. It's important that our Lord touch us and that we in turn stay focused and see only Jesus. We keep our gaze on him. And so the apostles are in that, in that upper room when word comes back that the tomb is empty. And then it starts to swirl that he is alive. And then he comes and he appears before them. But one of them isn't there. And let's face it, we can't fault Thomas. I know myself I don't fault him. They say to him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord, it's true. I won't believe that. I can't believe that. You can't tell me that he's alive as if what we saw on Friday didn't happen. It happened. I saw all the blood. I saw what they did to him. I saw how they beat him. And how they pierced his side. I saw it all. You can't tell me it didn't happen. And I'm not going to believe it until I have a chance to take my finger and put it into the nail marks of his hands. I'm going to put my hand into his side. And only then will I believe it. You see, for Thomas, the wounds of the body of Christ are real. The woundedness of Christ is real. We look at the church today and the woundedness of the body of Christ is real. And it's important for us to recognize that Jesus our Lord takes that woundedness upon himself for our sakes. And it's important for us to recognize there is woundedness in the body of Christ. And so Jesus appears before them. And Thomas is there. Thomas, go ahead, probe if you must, but don't continue with your disbelief. You know in scripture, Thomas never touches him. Thomas never touches him. But what Thomas does 
is he offers the ultimate profession of faith. Because it's in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, all throughout John's Gospel, the people are saying, who is this man? There's a Greek phrase, pothen. From where or from whence did this man come? See, John is absolutely um, mesmerized by this. It's John's gospel. Who is this man? It's John's gospel that be in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. You know, it, John is always trying to identify who is this man. And the answer to all of those questions all throughout John's gospel comes from the proclamation of faith, Thomas's lips. Who is this man? He is my Lord and my God. He is my Lord and my God. And for our part, in our journey as disciples, we have to get to that point of identifying who we are in relationship with him. Who is he? He is my Lord and my God. And who am I? I'm his disciple. Yes, I am. And to proclaim that before all the world, it's important that we do that. You know, it's interesting. I come here and, of course, sharing with you, it's not always easy being from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, coming to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> The crowd turns ugly. <laughs> so we get to learn a little bit in this area about cowboys. And one thing about cowboys and how they herd cattle, it's interesting whenever you see cowboys work, what they do is they have to push the cattle from behind. And there have to be cow cowboys on either side too in order to keep the herd together. <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's indicative of how, how they work and, and keeping the herd together. It's a little different. Cowboys, they're a little different than shepherds. With shepherds, what they do is they're not, in, they're not behind trying to corral, you know, all the herd. But rather, a shepherd, because sheep are so vastly different. A shepherd, he's out front. He's simply out front. And the sheep stay together instinctively. And the wolf won't approach as long as the shepherd's there. But if one of the sheep starts to stray and starts to fall behind, it becomes then a concern. But the shepherd is out front and leading. And indeed, that's exactly what Christ the Good Shepherd does, leads us. And for the sheep, they need to hear his voice. They need to hear him whistle. They need to hear something from him. And indeed for us too, it's important that we, you know, hear the shepherd and hear the shepherd speak to, to us and, and to our hearts. And you know those moments. You know the moments when the Lord is speaking to your heart. It's similar to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Weren't our hearts burning inside when he was opening scripture for us? Isn't it amazing? And you know those moments when, when the message of the Lord just really pierces your heart. It's important, I know, that during these days in the church, that the shepherds step up. And it's important that we do what is necessary in order to live out the great calling that God has placed before us. As the shepherd of this diocese, I want to say to all of you, stay strong in the faith. Stay close to our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to be models of faith for your sons and your daughters for your spouses, for the people in your family, your brothers and your sisters. It's not always easy. 
And there is a tendency in us, like the early apostles, to just simply mix into the crowd and watch from afar all that's happening. Step up. Truly be present. And identify who you are as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be in your presence. I will keep you in my prayers for the success of this gathering, for your wonderful relationship in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us bind ourselves in prayer. And if you get a chance to offer a prayer for me, I'd be grateful. 